All right. Welcome, welcome, everybody. I'm going to start off with a little introduction to Maisel's Documentary Center, and then um, we'll get started from here. But I'm happy to have Davey with me today. Um, yeah, so I want to thank you uh, for joining us for this sneak preview and discussion for 17 Blocks. I'm going to go through a few remarks, and then, as I said, we'll have the discussion. My name is Allison Lights. I'm a cinema programmer, uh, cinema programmer, and the manager of the cinema here in Harlem. And we normally screen films all year round in our micro cinema and have education programs for youth in Harlem and the South Bronx and for filmmaking. Obviously, right now uh, we're virtual, so uh, our education programs and cinema, as you've probably seen if you're here, are virtual as well. But um, we're incredibly grateful to still still be kicking as we say these days. Um, we've got lots of different films in our cinema right now and also, or in our virtual space right now and also um, coming up in the next couple of weeks. So I hope that you will check back in for those. Um, in the meantime, um, I'm very excited to be having um, this conversation tonight with you, Davey. Thank you. Uh, who, yeah, joining us from Los Angeles. This is a bi-coastal experience. <laughs> um, bi-coastal from our living rooms, I suppose, or offices. Yeah. Um, David Davy is a best-selling author, Emmy award-winning filmmaker, and a contributor to This American Life, as well as the editor and as the editor and publisher of Found Magazine. So, uh, I'll and I'll also um, for those of you watching the leaving a bit of room at the end or really whenever, if you have questions, feel free to ping them into the Q&A box that should be at the bottom of your screen. So, um, Davey, I would love to, I saw in the bio, it says a little bit about, or in the synopsis, it says a little bit about how you met Emmanuel and his family, but I would love if you want to. Sure. Get us. Yeah. Started yeah. There. It was, it was 1999. Um, I, I was, I just moved to DC. I was living on a friend's couch, basically, um, in Southeast DC. Um, and I was playing basketball every day. You know, I was, I was, I was playing basketball every day and I met these two young guys, Smurf and Emmanuel, you know, at the time they were like 15 and nine. Um, normally I would, I would play basketball with Smurf and his friends. And then, uh, Emmanuel would kind of watch us and beg to play. And we usually wouldn't let him. <laughs> But sometimes we really needed somebody, you know, he would step in the game and, and join in. And uh, they were both super welcoming and friendly. And I, I didn't know anybody. I was a little bit lost myself and far from my family. And, and they maybe sensed that. They asked if I wanted to come home to join them for dinner one night. And I, they lived just a few blocks from that court um, and a few blocks from where I was staying. And, uh, and I met Cheryl, their mom, and Denise, their sister, and I had a great time hanging out over there and ended up going back the next day and the day after that. And Cheryl likes to say that the family adopted me, which is kind of how it felt in a lot of ways because yeah, I, I, I think I, need, I needed that family at the time and, and they are just such welcoming people and so big hearted to me. And um, at the time I, I you know, I was interested in filmmaking. I didn't study it in college or anything, but I, I had just, got my first camera. It was nothing fancy. It was just like a little, you know, high eight tapes video camera you'd buy to, you know, shoot your birthday party or whatever. Um, but I was learning how to use it and, and Emmanuel, Smurf, Denise, they were all super interested in the camera. And so we just kind of learned how to use it together. And we would walk around the neighborhood filming, you know, filming whatever, whoever we ran into filming each other. I would, I remember I would set it up on a tripod and I would interview Emmanuel and then he would sit on the sofa and interview me. And, you know, we did that for months, uh, really with no plan. And I actually ended up moving out of DC about a year later, but stayed close in touch with them. And I would come back every year and say hi to them. We we'd, actually, I would come for Thanksgiving a lot and join them. And usually we'd film a little bit each time. And uh, as, as the years went on, you know, I, I don't, I don't know that we had any grand plan for this footage, but of course everything changed the night um, that Emmanuel was killed. And, uh, you know, um, I was not in DC that n night, but I got there the next day, you know, uh, Denise called to tell me what happened and, and I showed up just, you know, how can I help? And, and Cheryl said, where's the camera? 
I didn't really know what she meant. And she said, you know, she was naturally extremely upset. She just said, this is such a common story. This has happened to so many of my friends losing children in this way. But she was like, none of them have had their lives documented so thoroughly throughout their lives as Emmanuel. She, she, she immediately sort of grasped what value this footage could have and how it could help bring home to people, you know, on a really individual basis, like, you know, the, this vast scope of what's been happening, but she could put a, a face, a name and a face on it, you know? And so she was like, we have to film all this stuff. She, she knew the pain she was about to walk through in the weeks and months to follow. She was like, we, I just, we got to get this on camera. So, so I, we kept filming me, Smurf, Denise, um, another friend of mine in DC. And, um, and I thought that would be it, but we ended up filming for 10 more years. So, you know, it was 20 years in total. And I think, I think really when Justin got to be the age that Emmanuel had been, you know, he even, Emmanuel, uh, Justin and Cheryl talk about it, but when, when, when Justin got to be that age that Emmanuel had been, when I first met Emmanuel, it, it really felt like the circle, you know, it, the whole story had come full circle and, and we were like, okay, this, maybe the movie's done now. And so we, started sifting through realizing there was hundreds of really a thousand hours of footage and and we found a way to uh you know well we worked with this amazing amazing editor jen Teixeira, and uh she helped me and the family uh piece the story together um and so it, it it's really been a complete collaboration I'm, I'm really sorry cheryl cheryl really wanted to join us tonight um she's there's a lot going on right right now uh, I, th I think she's actually trying to take a friend to get vaccinated tonight um who had a someone had a last second chance but um and uh smurf also wanted to join us he's he's been work he works at that deli still um the deli counter at the giant food store in dc um he's just was recently promoted to first he was shift manager now he's manager of the deli um and he's really flourishing uh which is amazing but he's working crazy hours right now so um he couldn't join as well but but you know, we we it, it was such a collaboration. You know, not just that we all filmed. You know, the camera has been passed around between all of us. But beyond that, you know, just trying to shape the story, figure out what what story do we want to tell, and that's why I think Cheryl deserves so much credit for being so brave about revealing. You know, some things that are painful that are, you know, she says, you know. Um, you know, things that have felt shameful to her at times, but that she felt like were essential to have in the film. And so I, I just think that's part of also why the, the film has, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's, it's so raw and intimate. And I credit this, all the fam the whole family for, for being willing to share, not just their triumphs, but their heartbreaks and their struggles too. Yeah. Have you, um, I thank you for jumping in about Cheryl. I meant to mention that. At the yeah, yeah, well. sure, sure. Um, have, have, have you watched the film with the family, I presume? And what was, what was, I mean, it's, I imagine it's astounding to watch 20 years of your life all of a sudden be 97 minutes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so. definitely. Well, I mean, the family had seen, you know, the film uh, during the editing process. So it's, you know, it wasn't like a, a shock, but I think that certainly, um, you know, and they were, they were, providing ideas and notes and you know throughout the process mm -hmm. that being said still I think for them what was crazy was wasn't to see the movie because they had seen so many pieces of it over the years as we worked to edit it I think I think seeing it with a with an audience not necessarily recognize not knowing how people would respond and I was just thrilled I've been you know at, at the, they've been at several screenings uh, with an audience um before the pandemic started and uh and, and I think they just, just for them to feel the embrace of an audience, for them to feel the love that was going around the room, you know, they, um, they've spoken so beautifully and eloquently about the experience of making the film, but, and also, but just also, you know, the arc of their lives. And, and yeah, yeah, I think it is a trip for sure to see 20 years of your life on camera. I mean, they, it's the things Cheryl still doesn't like about the movie are like, a certain outfit that she was wearing or <laughs> or how her hair was done in a certain day she was like I can't believe I used to think that looked cool or <laughs> you know but um <laughs> but I think the I think I think we've all been really um uh, you know it's an emotional experience obviously to to watch it with with an audience and we all cry <laughs> but um every every time but uh 
but it's also really joyous to just to, to know that other people care and then and afterwards people are asking questions you know what what can we do to change the outcomes for for kids growing up in, in these neighborhoods and and so that has really launched us into some really great discussions yeah. and, and we've been able to connect with some people doing amazing work in dc and in other cities around the country and so you know the, the thing that cheryl i think the whole idea the reason she was so adamant about us filming even the darkest moments of this journey uh, was because she recognized that that this story could be used as a tool for change and so already you know we've been able to connect you know connect with organizations that um, are doing already doing great grassroots work in cities like dc and um and this story can help amplify their work just just by putting a an individual face on on this really enormous does you know tragedy and disaster that's continuing to occur around the country so we've been partnering with groups like every town for gun safety um black lives matter dc uh and and some of the organizations that they work with locally um gun, that do gun prevention work in in communities because there are proven tactics that work and they're not a mystery you know they're it's like these things work they require some funding but it's nothing crazy so it's just like trying to share the story with people you know uh people learn a manual story and they care about him and the fate of you know you see at the end of the film there's since emmanuel passed there's been you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of other deaths just in dc alone you know and you multiply that around the country cheryl and i once we were, she, you know, we kept talking about, we had filmed a lot of scenes where she's hanging out with um, other friends who had lost kids to, to gun violence. And and ultimately, you know, as we kept talking about as we were shaping the film, you know, it seemed like just focusing on the family themselves that you would kind of keep it intimate in that way. But, but it also felt like a shame to lose those, all those other voices. And then Cheryl and I, one day we were walking past the Vietnam War Memorial. She said, you know, there should be a, there should be a, memorial like this for the victims of gun violence in, in DC was what she was saying. And, and then as we were talking about that, we thought, well, maybe there's a way to do that. So at the end of the film, it almost feels like you're walking past this mm -hmm. memorial when you see all those names and you can picture that each one of those names has a film that could be made about their life, just like this one was made about Emmanuel. So um, you realize the, the, the vast scope of this tragedy, but, but, um, but just getting people to care is is the biggest thing, and so when people care, they they look into it. You know what are, what are the, what are the things that can be done? And um, so one one thing that we've done that we're really proud of is, you know, the summer after Emmanuel passed. Uh, I'm sorry, it's so dark in here. It's okay. <laughs> um, Sh Cheryl, Cheryl remembered that. I had always talked about taking Emmanuel camping and hiking because that's something I grew up doing and love to do. And she said, you know, why don't we do that this summer? Like, just grab a few kids from this neighborhood. Emmanuel, at 19, he, he was adored by all these younger kids in the neighborhood. And they would, they would follow him and chase him around the block. And he would, you know, he'd kind of give him a hard time, but, like, smile. And they, you know, he, he was kind of a mentor to a lot of the young kids on that block. And so um, – we invited a bunch of those kids to come with us on a, on a week-long camping trip. We went from Washington, D.C. to Mount Washington in New Hampshire. And uh, it was just like maybe 12 kids and and uh, Cheryl and, and Denise and Smurf and I and um, a couple other friends. It, it was it was really an amazing trip. And so we've done it every year since then. And it's grown to the point, you know, where um, not last year with the pandemic, but the year before we had 55 kids. Uh, from oh. D.C. and also Detroit and New Orleans now as well, joining us for a week. You know, sometimes we'll go to Shenandoah National Park. Sometimes we'll go to, we went to Sleeping Bear Dunes in northern Michigan. We we just hop in a bunch of vans and, and drive all over the, you know, wherever we, we could take and, and, and really see some transformative experiences. And, you know, a week in the woods isn't going to cure these kids of all the issues that they're, all the challenges they're facing, but but we can see that it is doing some really profound things and, and um some of the kids that came with us the first couple of years now are joining us as counselors and continuing to be a part of the trip. So anyways, anyone watching, we, you know, please check out our website, which is Washington to Washington.org. Um, and there's more information about our trips. We, we, we haven't 
yet scheduled our trip for this year, but, but um, we hope to be able to do one late this summer or early fall and um, bring another 50 or 60 kids with us. Yeah, that's great. Um, I know very well, having been now stuck in the city for a while, how much yeah. some trees can change your perspective. <laughs> it, it's really, it's really awesome. Just, just cause a lot of the kids have never been outside of just their little few block radius, you know? And, yeah. um, and just like you do such great work, um, mentoring kids and, and, and t introducing them to filmmaking. That's one of the components of our trip too, actually is, is to, um, is to, you know, give kids the, the cameras, just like, you know, Emmanuel took to the camera and Justin has now, um, um, I'm going to drop it in this chat here and I see a question from the great Nat Dykeman. So I'm very happy to see that he's in the house. Um, Washington to Washington.org. Okay, cool. Yeah. Check that out. And we'll, well, there's, there's a video on there that, that has some, some video from one of our early trips. Um, it looks like she's asking um, that, or she noted in the, opening sequence that there's a subtitle, the final cut, and said that that's changed over the years and was wondering um, how, what your, what was your philosophy about the changes you've made? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Um, I, uh, you know, I, I, we call the movie 17 Blocks, you know, the, the family, when I met them, they lived 17 blocks from the U.S. Capitol. And uh, let me just move this chat window. Um, and it's kind of crazy because, I mean, literally, it's in the shadow of the Capitol, like, and and yet it's known as one of the one of the most dangerous neighborhoods in the country. And and Cheryl has talked a lot about just how we, we were trying to even think what you know we used to call this film Emmanuel. And, but we also thought, well, this is really a film about, it's really a film about the whole family. And then of course, it's about this larger issue that's confronting American society. Uh, really many, many issues because gun violence is just one of many of the sort of institutional challenges that you see facing people who live in neighborhoods like the one that the Sanfords live in. So um, 17 blocks seem like it may be a challenge, you know, to those in power you know, hey, look, look at what's happening. You know, this is where you're sitting in the Capitol um, when you're not being chased out by mobs of rioters, but, but this, is, this is where you work in the Capitol and, and look what's happening right, right in the shadow of the building. You know, you, um, pay attention to us, pay attention to it. And we've been very excited just recently to be able to share this film with some people on Capitol Hill and, and including some congressmen and senators and, and for them to you know, recognize, uh, you know, the urgency of the situation and to want to make it a priority. As far as far as the, the subtitle, the final cut, um, you know, we made it in 2002, after I'd filmed with the family for a couple of years, we edited one version of the of the film together. And, and we said, Okay, well, that's probably that that's good. It's like, uh, it's that we'll call that the final cut. I think it's more of a, uh, of a joke between ourselves more than anything <laughs> that over the years has been many final cuts. But um, but this is the final cut for now. But you know, Justin has picked up a camera and started to film. So, so there there may be another version or or a sequel down the road. Yeah, I was gonna um, I was gonna ask. I mean, I guess now, sort of in retrospect, looking back, and for Justin, there's sort of a uh, you know like something to look to in terms of this has been done or this became this thing. It had you know it has a goal on some level, right? But I imagine for the first at least it, it sounds like the first 10 years before there was really sort of a clear goal. Like, was there, like, what was, what was the story arc? And like, were you just sort of like, oh, okay, I guess something new happened. So now it's a bigger film or what, how were you conceptualizing all of this footage at that point? In the very early stages. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, well, there was, <laughs> it's funny to think about now, but that in 2002, my friend, my friend, Jed Lackritz um, in, uh, he was an NYU, NYU student at the time, and um, uh, I spent like just a few months in New York with him editing a, ver a version of what just the footage that had been shot from like '99 to 2001, and um, uh, and and our, our rough cut was like two and a half hours long, <laughs> which is funny because that's only after two years of footage, and uh, and so, but but you know there was a lot going on in the family's life, and you dig into it in the first 20 minutes of this film, you get a 
scent and taste of it, you know, but we really got into the specifics. There's, you know, Smurf's friend, Anthony, uh, who you, you get to meet in back in 99. Um, you know, he was, he was, he was living with the family and, you know, we, you really got to know him more deeply and, um, and also just kind of, you know, digging more into the details of what, of the ups and downs of their life at, at the time, you know? So, I mean, you, you, you really, I'm such a big fan of, of the seven up series and Michael Apted, the great director who passed away recently, um, you know, and, and he told these great, you know, he, he compressed seven, each seven years was able to share these really epic stories about people's lives as they continue to unfold. So, you know, we probably could have made the, t you know, two hour version each year with, with the, with the updates. And ultimately, I mean, that's the challenge. How do you, how do you, how do you cut it down to 90 minutes, you know, but, um, 20 years, 20 years of footage, but, um, you know, there, in, in any life, there's, there's many, many stories you could tell. And, you know, I think, um, this is, this is one part of the story. And of course there's, there's a lot that we, that's not in the movie, but, um, you'll learn when you meet Cheryl and Smurf and Denise and, and Justin. Yeah, definitely. I noticed that there's a, um, or I noticed that you're sort of another world that you're part of is the found magazine and was looking into that a little bit. And it's also sort of, to me, seemed to have the same or a similar like element, or maybe it's different for you. I don't know. I'm curious to hear sort of if there's um, an impulse that feels similar to you between the found magazine work and this film. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. And thanks for asking about that. Um, yeah, Found Magazine is a magazine I made around the same time I met the Sanfords actually 20 years ago with some friends. Uh, it's it's notes and letters that people find on the ground and find on the street, love letters, to-do lists. You know, it gives you a little glimpse into other people's lives. And yeah, I mean, I think, I think you know, Found celebrates the fact that, you know, some little scrap of paper can actually reveal this great human story if it's the right journal entry or love letter, whatever it might be. But, um, you know, likewise, like on that basketball court, all right, Smurf was the one I happened to first befriend, you know, but there was like 15 other kids that used to hang out at that court. And I'm sure you could, you know, have if, if, if any of the others had invited me home for dinner, maybe maybe their <laughs> family's live would have been the ones in you know in this film so there certainly is a found element to it which is just like you know somebody whose life you just cross paths with ever so briefly um and, and could be so fleeting in this instance it's, it's turned into a 20 a very special 20-year friendship um and and a film um but i think I, th I think i think found is about having curiosity about the people we share the world with and i th i think my, my hope for with the with this film is that all of us can you know, try to aim that same curiosity, um, even on, on people whose lives are, are often pretty invisible, just because, um, you know, they're not, um, they, people in neighborhoods like the Sanfords don't of, often have, you know, a, a chance to have their voice heard, or their stories told. Um, so I think, I think just asking people to be curious about um, people, no matter where they live, and, and, you know, what their situation might be. Yeah, absolutely. Was there, um, is this something that uh, we can see coming up for, I and mean, is this gonna be part of your work moving forward as well? Is that something you're thinking about more conceptually in whatever you're working on next or what can we? You mean, you mean like this, this notion of like curiosity and trying to uncover, st or t t tell me a little bit more what you mean. Yeah, I think I mean like is, uh, yeah, the sort of the the idea of like uncovering people's lives from mm -hmm. like either in a planned situation or in a, um, I guess maybe I mean more in an unplanned way. I and what yeah. you're just looking yeah. towards next. Well, you know, and actually now that I think about it, I, I it's such a great question because I really hadn't thought too carefully about the, the similarities between found and this project, but. But you know, one thing that makes it so interesting about found is is that these notes were written. Nobody else, nobody planned for someone else to read them. You know, mm -hmm. so they are extremely private, personal, intimate notes because they were just, you know, written one person writing to a friend or even a journal entry to themselves. But I think likewise, this footage from this film, I think a lot of it was filmed as just like family home video or just somebody picking up the camera and filming and that. So I think I think it does share that really raw personal quality because it wasn't 
you know, nobody was, I guess, performing for a camera or, or, you know, trying to tell us a special story. People were just being themselves. And that's what I love about the found notes. You know, they're, they're so unselfconscious. And that's what I love about the, the, so much of the footage in this film. And, and so, yeah, yes. And, it, you know, I'm working on new film projects, documentary and scripted films. And, but that, that, but that, that quality is always one that I'll try to find, which is just those moments when people are naked in, you know, and, and without pretense and just, just being sort of utterly themselves like they would be if there was no camera around. Yeah, I think in that vein, um, one of my favorite scenes from this film was at the very beginning when Emmanuel's a kid and he's clearly just like running around with the camera and he like turns it on himself at some point and it just like feels so, um, there was some, I, I think I like laughed out loud or something, you know, when it happened because it was just like so relatable in the yeah. like kid with a camera way. <laughs> yeah, to totally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. What a, what a hilarious kid Emmanuel really, really was. And yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's funny for, for me to, I mean, there's, there as, as painful as the memories can be, I know for the Sanfords and, and for me of, of Emmanuel's premature death, um, I, there's also a lot of joy that comes out of just seeing him, uh, you know, ha having all those great moments captured, you know, and, and even, even beyond the stuff that's in the film, we, we often just sit together and we'll watch just some random tape that I have from, you know, I'm like, oh, I don't think we've ever looked at this one before. And it's mm -hmm. just me and Emmanuel and Denise, like, or Emmanuel and Denise like wrestling on the on the living room or whatever it might be, you know, for half an yeah. hour. So yeah. so it, there's it's we're it's we're, we're lucky and happy that that all that stuff that you know that we happen to let the camera roll as much as we did. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think I um sort of speaking of camera and the time that that I guess extra time in some ways that that gives him in this world. Um I a friend of mine had passed away also very prematurely a number of years ago now but I remember thinking like at being at the grocery store a few days or weeks later I don't know anymore and um seeing some like it was like a 30 under 30 list or something and I remember thinking wow the only thing that like she didn't get was this like chance to like put her work in in the world to like mm -hmm. be known enough you know to like I don't know that she was going to be on a 30 under 30 sure, list, but like sure. hypo in a hypothetical world, to right? Share. And there's a, yeah, to share what she had. She had it already. Like she mm -hmm. <laughs> was just the time to be able to share that. And I think there's a sort of beautiful element of Emmanuel's story really being able to kind of carry through time without him, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even though he can't be here. Some, some of his incandescence is, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, still is carried on with this film and I think through the Washington and the Washington camping trips um because we you know that's it's we we always do the trips in his memory and we talk about him when we uh every, when we climb whatever mountain we climb with this group of kids and and um and his spirit is definitely shining bright and, and living on through all those things what was your friend's name if I can ask uh Taya Anderson mm -hmm. thanks for car. yeah mm, thank you for sharing your story yeah, yeah. um yeah. Yeah, it's 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 hard, you know. Emmanuel just had a, a birthday a few weeks a few weeks ago, and you know the pain. Um, I, I I'm I've became a dad in the last couple of years, and I think I, you know I've always, you know, Emmanuel's loss has always profoundly affected me. But now that I'm a parent, I can just it it it, it you know the Cheryl's loss like it hits me harder than I. And, and in different ways than I ever really could imagine before that. And so that's not to say, you know, you can't, if you're not a parent, you can't imagine it or whatever, but it's just like, um, yeah. So that's, so that's been interesting to see that shift, but, but, but Cheryl, you know, she's such a unique um, and special person. And she wrote this beautiful poem about three days after Emmanuel died. Um, and in the poem, she forgave the, the two young men who had to had taken his life. And that, I mean, it's just pretty incredible uh, to have that ability to do that. But, but um, uh, you know, she's, she's very, she's very proud of her grandchildren, of her children and her grandchildren. And, and she's a great grand, she's an, an awesome grandmother. 
And I think she's getting the opportunity now to be the kind of grandmother, you know, to her grandkids, the way she, I think she wishes she had been able to, able to, able to do, be that picking up for lost time and, and has been a special person in her, in her, in her whole family's life. Yeah, the, the opening scene of her um, sort of revisiting the house that she had lived in and like having this sort of moment of, you know, it, it, there's so many complicated feelings it felt like going through her in that moment of like, mm. what didn't happen, what could have happened, what she thought might happen. Yeah. Yeah, it's totally. Fun. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think uh, she had a lot of hopes and dreams and, and you know, life life took a different course. And but but it, she, in a way she has, um, you know, the things she's always dreamed about, like she has is starting to find them. And the family just moved into a house. It's not you know, it's it's in southeast. It's in Anacostia, um, but it's it's bigger and nicer than the places they've lived before. And like, you know, they're 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 do them you know life still has its ups and downs but they're all doing really really remarkably well and um justin is keeps growing you know he's he was him and his cousin to kale smurf son to kale they were both on the honor roll the last two semesters and uh and justin's getting ready to start high school this fall um wow. and so it's 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 pretty nuts <laughs> just seeing seeing these kids continue to grow up and see you know Smurf, Smurf's son, Akil, we call him Lil Smurf. We, um, Lil Smurf is now the age that Smurf was when I first met, uh, when I first met Smurf. So that too is, is a trip. Wow. And I, you know, these kids get sassy with me and I remind them that I used to change their diapers. literally. So. <laughs> 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 then they, they, yeah, they, they have to ease, ease back. But, um, but, but another really special moment was, was last year when, um, was it when they met my son for the first time and, and seeing just how wonderfully Smurf, Smurf's sons to Kale and, and, and Lil Smurf and then uh, Justin, that just seeing, they were just so generous and warm and sweet with my son, Desmond. And um, and uh, it was just beautiful because I remembered all, it, it, I flashed back and I could remember all these kids when they were one and two years old. And, and so to see them playing with him and swinging him around and it, it was really special. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned that um, becoming a father changed your perspective, just or like understanding really of what Cheryl could have might have gone through. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And um, yeah, yeah, it's been it's been great. I'm I'm really lucky to have the family in my life, and you know the the, the pandemic's been really hard on not just the family, but but everyone in 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 the in their neighborhood. You know, it's just like it's been hard everywhere in the country, but, but you really do see not, not just the inequalities in terms of sickness and death and dying, but just like how, you know, when, when, when the economy drops out, like, you know, how there's no safety net and just, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been really tough, but, um, but, you know, we'll, we'll see. They're, 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 they're extremely, as you can see in the film, they're extremely, you know, the Stanford's are extremely resilient, you know, other, other people in their circle and, and my circle now, is, um, you know, have, have, have been having a tough, pretty tough time and, it, you know, we'll see. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. If anybody has um, any questions that you want to ask before we um, close out, please feel free to put those into the Q&A. Um, I guess I'm wondering if you're working already on your next project and um, how we can yeah. follow what you're doing, sure. all of that. Sure. Well, yeah, definitely. Um, well, you know, the movie, one thing I should say, this is a sneak preview. The movie's actually having its national release a week from Friday, so February 19th. Um, it's going to be showing in like 100 cities around the country through virtual screenings. We're going to have some, uh, some other events like this, but um, if you go to the 17 Blocks website or um, 17 blocks Facebook, 17 blocks Instagram. Um, we'll we'll be posting all of these updates and all the cities it's in. But but basically, if you have a friend that lives anywhere in the country and you want to share this film with them, like they'll be able to get it through their local uh, indie or art house theater. Um, so stay tuned for that and please help us spread the word. It really makes a big difference. Likewise, you can go to my personal um, Facebook or Instagram, Davy Rothbart. Um, I love connecting with people. If you have questions and you know you don't you can't fit them into this Q and A, but um, you have other questions or thoughts or ideas, I'm always interested to hear that. Likewise, um, 
if you have questions for the family, I'm happy to re relay relay those to them and, and help people connect with with, with uh, Cheryl and the rest of the family. Um, so yeah, just look my, look look me up. Come fi find me anywhere there. And um, yeah, as far as my new projects, um, I have uh, I have two or three documentary projects that are just um, um, in the in the earliest stages and. Uh, and then a, a scripted film project too. Um, it's based on a on a true story. So, you know, I think the, the pandemic has made things obviously more challenging to shoot and shoot things safely. But um, but you know, there's stories. I think that I don't think there's stories that will take 20 years to tell. But there, but there's stories that that I think ha hopefully it will have some of the the um, the depth and 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 humor of, of, of my time, uh, with the Sanfords and, and, um, yeah, uh, just can't wait to, yeah. And that's, that's why I ask people also to find my Facebook page. Cause I, I'll post updates when I have new, new projects coming out and, and, um, love to stay in touch with people. That's great. Thank you so much. We appreciate you taking the time. Thank, thank you, Allison. Yeah. I'm such a fan of, uh, of the, of the programming that you do and, and the work at Maisel Documentary Center, uh, Film Center. So this is a real honor to be, to, you know, to be able to share a film with, with your audiences and, and to get to chat about the film with you. Thanks, thanks. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Yeah, likewise. Yeah, and, and, and the Sanfords, the Sanfords appreciate it too. I know they, they were very excited to, to know that, that you would be sharing the film this way. Oh, good. I'm glad. We're happy to, happy to do it. <laughs> yeah. All right. Take Great. care. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night.